All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Nine Finger Chronicles podcast. And today I am joined by Mr. Bill Winky. Bill, how are we doing, man? Good. How are you, Dan? I'm doing good, man. Doing good. Uh, how's the velvet scene looking on uh, on your properties this year? Oh, I, you know, I haven't got out enough. Probably uh, they'll they'll be they'll be there. You know, I, I guess that's one yeah. thing that uh, I don't get quite as as revved up in the summer as what I used to. You know, I'd be out there glassing and filming, and then you know the fall would come and most of those bucks that I saw in the summer weren't there anyway. Um, so I kind of tune back, get all my projects done and then just really lock in starting in September. Gotcha. Gotcha. A lot of people try anyway. And I was always under this assumption where I needed to give, if I was doing any type of summer work, like trimming out uh, tree stand locations or hanging trail cameras, I needed to get all my work done at least 30 days before I would plan on hunting it. So the timber took a rest or the farm took a, a break from any type of human intrusion. Uh, do you live or die by any specific dates where you have to leave your property and then not come back till you're, you're ready to hunt it? I think a lot of it has to do with the location. Uh, you know, like a big parts of our farm, uh, have a consistent maybe human traffic let's say you know like people going through there you know we're in there planting food plots we're checking up on stuff you know so there's places where the deer are used to the normal human behavior and it's non-threatening and then there's other areas where where that would be seen as a big intrusion so i, I don't worry about it too much unless i'm going in close to bedding areas then Usually what I'll do when I hunt near bedding areas is try to go in and hang the stand when I go in to hunt it. Um, and that way I don't have a separate trip in. I mean, it'd be ideal if you could hang it now, but it's so miserable hanging tree stands right now. Uh, you know, the post season is another really good time for doing that if you're gonna go in close to bedding areas, but it's also not so bad to go in on a windy afternoon and hang it right during the season. Yeah, okay. On the properties that you hunt, do you have a sanctuary type of area where you just, it's a no-go, you never go into it? I, I think that I've got a different philosophy on that. I hunt all the places or all the parts of the farm or any place that I go, whether it's a lease or permission or whatever, even public land. I hunt the places where you can get away with hunting there without the deer knowing. I hunt all of those spots. And then any spot that's not like that, I leave those as the sanctuaries. So rather than saying, do you have a specific sanctuary? No, but a lot of times a big part of the property becomes a sanctuary because it's so hard to hunt those areas without the deer knowing that you end up just fringing yeah. on those. You don't go into them. Um, so by default, I end up with them, but I don't intentionally create them. Gotcha. Now, does that then have an impact on how you access those good places? Uh, and, and I'm specifically asking about your the process of identifying an access route to those good uh, yeah. places. Yeah, and I think area. that's really, that's almost what defines those spots is the access. Uh, so the, the, the access is so critical. And, and I know that people are talking about it a lot more than they used to. Gosh, when I started writing for magazines a long time ago, people would just blunder right into their stands. And I remember reading an article one time where the author said, stalk your stand. I'm like, what, you know, what does he mean by that? Well, now it's just such common knowledge that the entry and exit is important, but it's still sometimes not taken to the extreme that it should be. If the deer know right. that you're hunting them, they're so hard to kill. Um, so it's the spots that you can't access easily without the deer knowing that become the sanctuaries. So in other words, the spots that I hunt are almost always defined by their access rather than by the sign or something characteristic to that location. Uh, I, I do it backwards. So basically I take my farm apart from an access standpoint and then I figure out what are the best stands near those ideal entry and exit routes where I can still have some chance of success. 
rather than saying, oh, I've got this perfect spot. How do I get to it? I flip it and I say, okay, I've got these perfect entry and exit routes. Where do I sit? Yeah. Yeah. And it, man, it was a long time ago and I can't remember if it was a video that you did or an article that you wrote where, where it, I think you, you use the term reverse engineer. Uh, a good stand location based off of the the access route itself. And then you started mm -hmm. talking about waterways. And I will say that that article or that video, I can't remember what which one it was, had an absolute huge impact on the strategy that I implement today where I put more emphasis on the access route probably than I do the tree stand location. Yeah, I, I, so, think, I think that's the whole game now, Dan. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. So I think if you get the entry and exit right, uh, you know, eventually you're going to have some success. But as soon as the deer know that you're hunting them, um, boy, it comes to a screeching halt pretty fast. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where I like I, I have personally have found the most success is once you realize that the access is probably more important than the actual stand location. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got more deer within shooting range. Um, I could hunt stands way more uh, yeah. than just one time or That's two right. times before they kind of fizz fizzled out along with, you know, the right wind direction. But I kind of want to shift gears here a second. And right now there's, there's a lot of guys out there that maybe have just gained access to a farm. Maybe they bought a farm. Maybe they just got a lease. And they're starting from scratch on a new property. What would your process be to a brand new farm in order to have it ready by, let's say, October 1 to start hunting this, this upcoming fall? Yeah, and I've done it a bunch over the years because I used to travel to hunt quite a bit, which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know that over the years, how many times I hunted out of state and and. Rarely do you have the benefit of scouting. I didn't really like hunting with outfitters. Not that it's a bad thing. It's just, it just wasn't what I enjoyed. Um, so I'd have to go in there and try to solve the puzzle every time. Well, you can't do a whole bunch of scouting. You can't be on the ground walking and covering the area like you would, you know, if you had the month of January, let's say. Um, so you have to do almost all of it with the aerial photos and the topo maps. And it's, it's a, you can really get, I would say, you can get 75% dialed in without ever putting your feet on the property uh, because yeah. the deer relate to certain terrain features very predictably. So you find those terrain features almost anywhere um, and, you, and you know how the deer are going to move through those. And it's, you know, none of it's even really that complicated. It's more like they're, they're funnels. Um, there's certain places that invite the deer to travel because it's like the path of least resistance. And then there are other funnels that are created by an impasse, you know, like the high bank of a creek or a bluff edge or the side of a lake or whatever. So there's places where the deer won't go. So that means there's going to be a place right next to it where they do go. Um, so once you get comfortable knowing how they relate to certain terrain features, uh, all you got to do is find those and you've got a great stand. And, and, you know, you can go in and confirm those spots. Or you can just carry your stand in and put it up and pretty good chance you're going to be, you know, pretty, pretty much in the chips. Yeah. Yeah. So you've done your due diligence. You've gone and you've done your e-scouting per se, and you're sitting there and now it's time to actually put boots on the ground. When you go and walk a property for the first time, let's say it's before hunting season. What is Bill Winky looking for that, would be an ideal tree stand location or access route to get to that tree stand location? Well, well, I love creeks and ditches, any place that they exist, or even rivers. Uh, yeah. It's just, the deer just don't seem to have the same level of awareness when you're moving through those locations. Uh, I could tell you story after story of, you know, sneaking in along creeks or going through a ditch in the, you know, pre-dawn dark and have bucks, you know, cross three or four feet away. I mean, just crazy stuff. You know, you'll be sneaking along and you'll hear something, you'll look up and there'll be a, a buck standing on the edge of the, you know, the ditch right above you. And he crosses, you know, 
just a couple of feet away, like you can tap him with your arrow. Um, they just aren't aware of what's going on in those kind of locations. And especially if you take the time to go in there ahead of time and clean them out so that you can sneak through quietly and easily. Uh, those are awesome. Any, anytime you can find those kind of spots, um, that's what you're after. You want the creeks and the ditches as often as you can. Uh, then I'll look for, I really like hardwood ridges. Um, they can be a little bit challenging to get into, <clears throat> but if you go in at midday when the wind is blowing um, and you come in from the opposite direction of where you think the deer are bedded, um, you can, a lot of times you can get into those spots too, but you're not going to hunt those areas on a still day, not, not getting in and out. Um, so I really like them because the, the deer seem to relate to that terrain uh, very predictably. I mean, they bed generally on the ridges, during the rut, the bucks are cruising those areas looking for does. I mean, it's it's just a really cool, classic kind of a hunt. Um, so I look for those a lot. Uh, any kind of funnel, uh, you can you can walk a ditch and you can find where the deer are crossing the ditch. Well, there's a great funnel. You can walk a creek and see where they're crossing the creek. You know, it's stuff like that. Um, then the final thing I would look for is probably the feeding areas. Those are pretty obvious usually. Um, you know, if there's no ag around, then it's going to be harder because you got to find you know, whatever browse that they might be feeding on, or, you know, sometimes it's acorns, like last year was a massive amount of acorns, but uh, that, that's my approach. And again, it really does start with the entry and exit. And gosh, so much of the, you know, I've really changed my mindset on that. And, and um, to the point now where if I wasn't filming, you know, a lot of times I just wouldn't leave the woods at night because the coming and going is what gets you in trouble. You know, you, you, right. you get in there at midday, you hunt the stand, you get down, you sleep someplace, you know, near the base of the tree and you get back up the next morning. And it's so much better than if you try to go all the way in and all the way out, you know, at a time when the deer are really, you know, keyed in on that kind of sound and that kind of movement. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that when you were when you were doing that the other year and i yeah. just i was like this dude's nuts this dude's crazy like yeah. you gotta be crazy to do something like that well it, it's way a tree. i know and people have said that but if you think about it um i mean the sleeping bags and stuff are so warm now that it really isn't yeah. nearly as radical as what you think i mean think about the guys that spike camp for elk right. nobody thinks twice about that you know why don't you just spike right. camp for white right. tails um it's it, it was way easier than what I thought it was going to be. You know, it, it just, it was a yeah. piece of cake, really. It was, uh, yeah. I enjoyed it, actually. How many days did you did you hunt that one spot or bounce around in that area and then sleep in that area? Well, there was 12, it took me 12 or 14 days to kill that deer. And it was just one ridge. Maybe the ridge was a quarter of a mile long, uh, I would say. It was like a, a secondary point coming off a primary ridge. So that's where he was spending most of his time. And I didn't have any trail camera pictures of him from that year, but from the year before, uh, I'd hunted that same property and, and had a lot of um, history with that deer. So I kind of knew where he wanted to live to begin with. So I never slept anywhere but either at the on the ground near the stand or in my blinds. So any, I had some redneck blinds on trailers and I hauled them in there and then I put those around maybe where I thought he might possibly be feeding. And that didn't really work. You know, that, that part of it didn't work. He was up on the ridge almost all the time, but at least that kept me in the game. You know, so I'd, on, on yeah. some days I'd go in, if the wind wasn't right for the ridge stands, I'd go into the blinds and then I would just spend the night sleeping in those. And it was pretty funny, you know, like you'd wake up at two in the morning and it's like you'd have to take a leak out the back door of the blind and you'd peek out the front window and there's like five deer about <laughs> 10 yards away feeding in the corn. And you're thinking, gosh, dang it, how am I going to do this? I can't hold this any longer. You know, so then, you know, you'd, you'd take your little leak and peek back out the front window and they'd still be there like looking around like, what the heck does that sound? Um, no, it, it's funny. pretty comical what you can get away with. Uh, you know, but you got to keep the windows closed and all that stuff in those blinds, you know, because the, that'll... They'll, they'll hold the scent in. But anyway, that was that was how I did it. I I never did sleep during that whole couple of weeks anywhere, but either in the blind or up on the ridge. Yeah. And so uh, you, you, you finally got it done. 
like uh, you, you got, I mean, you got the job done with it. So kudos to you for, I guess I would say to you, it's, it seems like that's not crazy, but for a lot of people like myself, I'm like, Holy cow, that takes some well, severe, like some serious dedication. Well, and, and I've had a lot of people contact me after that, Dan, that, that do it. Um, but what they, what they do a lot of times is they'll go in by canoe into an area and they'll just flip the canoe over and sleep underneath the canoe, you know, or whatever it might be. You know, I was surprised yeah. how many people kind of came out and said, yeah, I've been doing this for 15 years, you know, or whatever, you know, because again, yeah. if entry and exit is how you ruin a spot, um, you know, like, like, I, like I, I, my saying that came out of it was, you know, if, if you can't hunt the spot, you know, if you can't get in and out of there without the deer knowing, you either can't hunt it or you can't leave, you know, one or the other. Mm-hmm. You know, there's really no middle ground. You can't keep hunting a spot where the deer know that you're hunting them. Uh, it doesn't work. So if you're going to hunt that spot, then you've got to go to whatever extreme is necessary. And, right. you know, in the evenings, it, this, the wind dies down and you try to crunch, crunch, crunch your way out of there. It's just miserable. I mean, there are spots where you can sneak in and out real easy. I'm not saying you should do this all the time. I'm just saying that I had to because of the way that ridge was set up. I didn't have any options. The only way to come out of there in the evenings was down through the valley and through where all the deer were feeding. It just wasn't sustainable. Uh, anyway, you, right. you get it. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, aside from that, <laughs> you, you've gone you've gone into a new property. Okay, you're doing your boots on the ground scouting and things like that. How important to you? is sign from the previous year. Yeah. You know, I think when I first started out, I paid more attention to sign. I, I have to be honest with you. I don't know that I even look at it anymore. Uh, I think more so, let's say, in October than I do in November. Mm-hmm. I think sign means something in October. Uh, I don't think it means anything in November. Um, I think November you have to go by, like, playing the odds. This spot, the odds are better because it's a funnel and it's between two doe bedding areas. You know, it doesn't really matter whether the evidence is there or not. The behavior is going to, you know, but in October, because the deer more are more patterned, more patternable, you know, the bucks haven't really gone into the, you know, the heavy duty rut phase yet. Uh, I do think then finding scrapes and, and big rubs you know, that last week of October would, you'd get rewarded for that. Um, so that, okay. that's the only time I think I would really think about it. And then of course, late season, again, you, you know, you find the trails leading into the food sources, but that's pretty obvious. Yeah. So, so anyway, so... To keep it real, real quick. It seems ironic, but I don't pay any attention to rut sign during the rut. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I've kind of fallen into that. Like my, Me personally, my favorite time, and I talk about this all the time, my favorite time to kill deer is when the bucks are ready to breed, but the does are not ready to breed. And I have just found myself like just being ultra successful and really leaning into that time of year, that that pre-rut time frame. And when I mean pre-rut, I mean pre-rut into the first couple days, three, four days of November right? on the farms that I hunt. No, so I, I, I totally days. agree. I think, I think there's, that is probably, if you're hunting one specific buck, that's probably the best time to try to get him. Um, Cause he's still more or less in his normal range, but he's just traveling more. Uh, and then you get into the actual breeding and he might be tied up with the doe and he might be, you know, a half mile away or a quarter mile away and not even moving, you know, because she's not moving. Um, so, yeah, the other one is if you can catch it, the, the woods goes crazy when the first doe comes in nesters. Um, you know, so I call it the first hot doe. The first hot doe is like, mm-hmm. you know, like if it was, you know, wolves going after a chunk of T-bone steak. You know, it's like the whole, yeah. the whole woods goes crazy. Yeah. Have you found that first doe to come in like in mid-October at the beginning of the bell curve? Or have you 
seen that first doe come in like around that late October time frame? Well, I think you could call it a false rut, but there is a little mini rut mm -hmm. in mid-October. And you'll see like a little flare up, you know, for three or four days, maybe right in the middle of October. And unless you're really paying attention, you won't even notice it because there's only a very few does that come into estrus that early. You know, most of them are coming in in November, you know, throughout the areas that I hunt. So normally when I think of the first hot doe, I'm thinking of something around the Halloween through about the second or third of November, somewhere in there is usually, that's usually about where you, you yeah. see that most obvious. Yeah. Yeah. I I agree. That's like, again, and it kind of just matches up to if you were to put all the dates on a map or, on, you know, on a graph of where I've been, where I personally have been successful, it's in, it's in that exact time frame. So, um, now when it comes to identifying a specific deer, right? Like I'll just talk to you a little bit about how I operate. I, I, I have tried to hunt, um, specific a, a specific deer in the past and i've passed a lot of deer that i i look back and i say man i really i really wish i would have shot that deer because i've i've passed very good very good deer for my area and so and so i missed out on a couple arrows putting arrows through chip shot deer because i wanted the biggest baddest buck on the property and i i long story short i didn't get him so what does someone need to understand when they take that next step from selecting a basket full of deer that are shooters to one deer that is a shooter? Yeah, I think the first thing you got to figure out is whether that deer is truly killable. Because um, I, I hunted a buck one year for 50 some straight days and I never saw him. And that was, you know, when that season was over, I vowed that I would never do that again, even though he was the biggest deer on the farm. He just wasn't showing up on my trail cameras in daylight. And he just, you know, some, some bucks are very killable. They show you that they are, you know, they just tell you ahead of time, Hey, you know, I'm kind of, you know, lackadaisical and move around during the day. And I've got a fairly small core area that I live, you know, spend most of my time in. You can come and kill me pretty easy, you know, comparatively. And then there are others that are just in and out, you know, you see them, maybe once or twice on camera, then a week later they pop in again. And, you know, sometimes they're, you know, right on the fringe of daylight, but usually it's like, you know, nine o'clock or 10 o'clock PM. It's like, dang it. You know, that you're not really hunting him. You know, you, to, to hunt that deer, you got to find out where he's living. And he's not living right where you're getting the pictures of him. So um, I think that's the, the first thing is don't, don't set yourself up trying to kill a buck. That's really not killable. Um, I also think that unless he's really, really special, um, you know, most of them are really special. So they don't have to be really, really special, <laughs> you know, so let's say any mature <laughs> buck, you know, is, is going to be really special. And then occasionally there's that deer that's, you know, one level above and, you know, then maybe it's worth it. But I would rather go into the season having two or three that I'm really excited about, even though one of them may be a lot bigger. You're going to be super proud of any one of those three. Um, then as the season plays out, you can find out which ones are more killable. Uh, it's, it can be really frustrating, like I said, to, to uh, you know, go after one and then find out after the season that you know, he wasn't even killable. You know, it was such a waste right. of time. And they'll change from one year to the next. That same deer might be super killable the next year. So it's, uh, right. you never 100% give up on that deer. He's just that one during that age. You know, and we could talk about the behavior versus their age, but there is a, a period when they're super, like, uh, I would say not completely nocturnal, but a lot more cautious. And then it's almost like they pass that, that period and then they just become, you know, a lot easier to kill. So, right, right. What, what year, in your opinion, what year is that? If you're going to give a deer a year where yeah. you know, they are super, they're super tight they're they're nocturnal a lot they don't take risks what year is that and then what year do they kind of come out of that yeah and, and you know i've seen it and, and i also heard you know a, a video one time where mark jury was talking about it. he called it the ghost years and that's age four and five um you know in, in most areas where there's a decent number of 
you know, let's say a, a huntable number of mature bucks. I mean, obviously there's parts of the country where some of this just doesn't even apply because the deer don't get three years old, let alone four or five. Um, but let's just say that you're hunting in the Midwest, maybe the Northwest, maybe into Canada, Western states, places where the pressure is light enough in a lot of areas where the deer that do get some age, uh, they, they seem to be the hardest to, to kill when they're four and five. And then when they hit six, something happens. Uh, and, and I love it. I love it because now all of a sudden, um, that buck that was almost completely reclusive the year before is everywhere in daylight on three or four of your cameras like all the time. And then you know you're going to kill him. As long as you don't screw it up, you're going to kill him. You know, and, but that for most of those guys, it starts at age six. You know, and, and uh, yeah. it's kind of strange because everybody thinks that they become old and, and, you know, savvy. But I suppose they do if they're getting pressured all the time. But, you know, their, their natural physiology is that they're a lot more cautious at four and five and less cautious at six. As long as they're not being messed with all the time, you know, and, and uh, I definitely have seen that. I always tell people that, yeah, if you got a six year old buck, you're probably going to get him. <laughs> you know, they're just so much different. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do, do you feel like that then translates to different states where a four-year-old is a very rare deer? Like, let's say Michigan, Pennsylvania, yeah. New York? <clears throat> no, I don't. I don't think that they still got to get to six. There's something in them. You know, they're, they're, they're sort of like people, you know, on an analogy type of a level. You know, like people get old and then they just get like, I don't know whether we get senile or we just get casual. It's like, you know, you just don't do stuff as well as you used to. You know, you're not as careful. You're not like, you know, your business practices aren't as clean and sharp. And just, you just kind of aren't as good as what you used to be, you know, unfortunately. And that's just the reality of getting older. Well, the deer, I think, are the same. They just get a little more casual about their existence. Um, and I, I think a little bit sometimes they're shifting gears from worrying about dominance to just eating. <laughs> they just, yeah. they, they don't seem to care. They're just like, Hey, I want a mouthful yeah. of soybeans. I don't care if it's four o'clock in the afternoon, you know, I'm going to go out and get some. <laughs> that kind of uh, reflects my own life where I'm, I'm worried <laughs> less about dominance and more about eating. <laughs> so, but don't uh, give up on breeding. Uh, don't give up on breeding. <laughs> I love it. Uh, that hey, I don't have control over that anymore. Like, <laughs> hey, the does control the rut. That's the same thing in my household, man. Uh, so. <laughs> all right. Well, we better be careful here. Um Exactly, exactly. So uh I want to end this conversation with this question. And that is, in your opinion, where do serious hunters and I want to keep this to bow hunting because that's all I really do. Like, like I don't do a lot of gun hunting, but this last question, what do serious hunters do that is more of a problem for them than actually helps them succeed? What's, what's one thing that they do that hurts them more than helps them? Hmm. Gosh, the serious ones. Yeah. Boy, I think, I do think that maybe, maybe what we've talked about, maybe getting hung up on one buck might be it. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it's so tempting to do, and I've done it, and I'm sure I'll do it again, you know, but you go into the season with one target, gosh, even just like one property, let's say, you just don't have options. And no matter how good you are, eventually the deer there know that you're hunting them and because yeah. the serious hunter is putting in a quite a bit of time. So, mm -hmm. you know, that it just seems to me like that might be the, the place where they could err. Uh, there's a lot of really good bow hunters in this country. Uh, I'm, I'm just really shocked. You know, the, the, the number again, if you go back 20 or 25 years, nobody knew what they were doing. You know, and now it just seems like everybody does. So there's a lot of really effective, you know, really savvy kind of bow hunter. So um, you don't see people making the, the old mistakes. 
you, you know, and, but I mean, obviously you can get tempted. Even serious bow hunters can get tempted by sign. Um, and just to say, well, I've got to hunt that spot, you know, no matter what. Well, that's, that's the kiss of death. I mean, there's only some, so many spots you can hunt effectively. And as soon as you say, I've got to hunt this spot, no matter what, then, you know, you're, you're going to start to, you know, you're going to start the, the ticking clock on that property. It's going to be shutting down, you know, pretty soon if you keep that mindset. But um, people are getting smart enough now. They, they know, they know how to hunt. It, it's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm truly impressed with how many people really get it now. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's funny how I, I'm a, I'm a believer in woodsmanship. Like I, I, I feel like in order to be really good at what you do, and I, I just want to say targeting mature whitetails, you know, four year old deer or older, um, you gotta, you gotta have good woodsmanship, I feel, but there's a lot of content out there. There's a lot of videos that help a person flatten the curve. Yes. And that was not around when I started. No, no. And that's the biggest difference now was we all, we had to learn so much just by trial and error, you know, by making mistakes and then trying to learn from our mistakes. And sometimes you'd go three or four seasons making the same mistake before you realize that it was a mistake. You know, you just... You chalk it up to just whitetails being whitetails. Well, they're hard to kill. You know, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. You know, but the reality is you were just not good, you know, and you didn't realize it yeah. because there wasn't enough feedback. There wasn't information available. That's a fact. <laughs> well, I tell you what, Bill, man, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to do this. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, good luck this upcoming season. Yeah, you too. I appreciate it, Dan. You have a great day.